what percentage of people, the, those professionals working in the city, are actually taking drugs, but I'm not talking mm -hmm. recreationally, I'm talking taking drugs to enhance the performance, because perhaps that's the necessary requirement. It's difficult to say. I, I, you know, in the city, we keep our drug intake really, really well hidden because it, it, you can lose your job from it. And in America, they will have random drug tests and so forth. So no one knows about it. But sometimes, you know. What your estimate? I, I mean, it, you know, honestly. Is it 50%? No, or is no, it 80? No, no. Is it's it 10%? 10, it's 10%. Okay. It's 10 because the problem is, is that in Britain, in London, everyone's taking cocaine at the moment. That's the simple truth. You go into any toilet of any dubious pub and you look at the, the, the cistern and there's white crumbs. Now, if you've got young men who've been working hard all week, who like a drink, who want to stay up all night and they've got lots of money, they're going to take cocaine. And, you know, to be honest with you, I did a lot of it with a lot of my clients and I'm not proud of it and those days are over. But, you know, I used to be very naughty and that used to be one way I bonded with my clients. So can you say that it is necessary to even survive in that culture <laughs> under all the stress and you know, to be able to socialize with these people? Well, it certainly helped me. But there, there, to be honest with you, the system is changing now. The, there is a whole breed of people entering the city who want nothing more to make money and to be very professional. And one thing that is slightly tragic about my book, City Boy, is that in many ways it's a warning to people about how a nice person can become a complete nasty, ruthless idiot. And yet all the emails I receive from my readers are saying, please tell me how you get this job, <laughs> because it sounds wonderful. <laughs> you are also an advocate for the sort of ethical approaches to uh, business. Is that even possible in finance where the profit motive is crucial? I'm afraid to say that I am very skeptical about what we call corporate social responsibility. But let's just be honest here. The shareholders of a company have got one reason for holding those shares, and that is increasing their capital. And the only thing that those guys in the boardroom are interested in is increasing their quarterly profits. There is a great documentary which actually suggests large corporations are like psychopaths. They show no remorse. They have no compassion. They don't care about laws. You know, and they will do anything in their power to achieve their one goal. And that's why, ironically, since corporations effectively run this world, we are effectively being run by a bunch of psychopaths who will do, screw up the environment, screw up society, and well, they don't what is care. The what, what is the alternative? We, we need strict regulation. We need people like, for example, British... Well, strict, you say strict regulation, but now uh, when the regulation is created by the regulators, the regulators are controlled usually by politicians, and politicians can be just as corrupt as the guys in the corporate sector, which is yeah. actually what very often happens. Well, the regulation is created But then the regulators demand, must be made of. independent of the politicians. And, the regulator, and what the regulatory priorities must be, they must give a genuine deterrent for companies to, to, to do wrong. Let me give you one example. I know someone who worked in the environmental division of a very large petroleum company. And he said that they made a balanced decision about whether they should break environmental laws or not, based on the, how, the chances of getting caught and the, the fine if they were caught. So in other words, we're going to break laws if it increases our profits on a risk-adjusted basis. I mean, this is crazy. This is, this is what the world's being run by. And it does mean, I'm afraid, that unless this stops, that the environment will get worse, society will get more divided, and we'll just have more boom and bust. And this is why I wrote the book in many ways, to warn people about this crazy mentality. Do we have less moral hazard now that, than we had, let's say, when you were writing the book? No. Uh, to be honest with you, um, I, I, I'm a bit of a pessimist. You know, I, I see the changes in reform and, and regulation that is suggested by Obama and in the UK and elsewhere. So far, we've seen very little concrete. At the moment, the simple fact is that more and more people want to go into the city. And ironically, the recent financial crisis we've had has in fact created more financial crime because people think, I may not have a job in a year's time, I might as well go crazy. You know, 30% of all takeovers by companies in the UK are preceded by um, suspicious trades. 
That is not my judgment, that's the judgment of the city regulator, and yet no one gets caught for insider trading. It's a Wild West casino, and I would say, to mix my metaphors, that the loonies have taken over the asylum. I'm sorry, it's, and it's, it's particularly since the hedge funds got so much power. When do you think that someone else will write a similar book <laughs> describing the, the low thing in the square mile? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that prior to my book, there had been a space of 20 years since someone had written a popular book exposing the city and all Wall Street. And the reason for that is there is a code of silence. And if you break that code, you are what we call persona non grata. Since I've written my book, there have been about four or five or maybe ten that, it, that other people have written. Um, all I can say is that I would be writing the next definitive book. <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to try and write another book where I focus on some other elements of corruption, notably money laundering, which again is something that happens in the city of London a hell of a lot. Garen, thank you. Thank you.